In ending C of Fear and Hunger Termina, we meet a new god, and we're told almost nothing about him. Wait, hang on. This is the script of the last video. Uh, one second. Uh, here. This video will answer the questions left over from the last video. Today, we're going to answer why Sulfur was killed, why Vitruvia is trying to resurrect him, and finally, I'm going to tell you who the Sun God is. I'll summarize the last video beforehand, but I do recommend watching that one first. It'll not only explain the background for these theories, but also provide a full explanation for how the gods work. Once you've done that, come back here and we can set about some new theories. And like all my lore videos, I do recommend playing the game first to experience it firsthand. To begin with, let me refresh your memory of the previous lore video. If you've just watched it, feel free to go to this timestamp on the screen now to continue on with the new theories. The three main points in that video were, the goddess Vitruvia was the mastermind behind Ormir's ascension to godhood, the dark twin born during this ascension, Sulphur, was secretly the dominant twin but pretended to be Ormir for unknown reasons, and thus all Ormir worship in Europa was secretly Sulphur worship, and Sulphur, while pretending to be Ormir, was the king of Mahab. Vitruvia was a mysterious goddess who is, most likely, but not definitely, a new god. She is the architect of humanity and of Ormir, as she sought to create the perfect man. Her name is based on the Vitruvian man, a real-world art piece about the perfect proportions of man, which the sigils of Ormir and the mysterious unknown symbol from the first game combined together to create a match. This led me to believe that Vitruvia planned out Ormir's ascension to godhood to create a man-god. As for why she would do this, the old gods wanted to leave Mahab to the humans, and likely made Vitruvia elevate a human to be powerful enough to be king of humanity and Mahab. The sun god and the human Ormir were sacrificed for this process. But something went wrong. Two gods were born from this union, and the negative emotions that were supposed to be cast aside ended up in the dominant god, what we call Sulphur. For some reason, Sulphur pretended to be Ormir, conquering his way across Europa and killing the ruling new gods of the time. The good parts of him, the real Ormir, were banished to outside Europa, left to languish in relative obscurity compared to the violent and bloody Sulphur, who established a new order of old god worship with himself as the king of Mahab the other old gods long gone. His new kingdom was destined to last for the ages. But it didn't. Somehow, Sulphur was killed less than 800 years after he was born, and likely much earlier. His corpse can be found in the tombs outside Mahab, eventually rotting to a skeleton. His worship stayed strong, though. For the next 2,000 years, people regularly prayed and sacrificed to him. However, they thought they were worshipping the benevolent Ormir, not Sulphur. The black priests of Preheval were among the few who knew the truth of this ancient conspiracy, that not even the wise and ancient Enki knew. During the festival, we see the cult of Sulphur performing strange rites that just seem like mindless violence. They are obsessed with dismembering and reattaching limbs, particularly heads. Their actions are eerily similar to those associated with Vitruvia, which is odd, because it seemed like Vitruvia didn't want to make Sulphur, but Ormir. At the end of the video, we were left with three main questions. Why does it seem like Vitruvia is helping the cult of Sulphur? Why was Sulphur even killed in the first place? And finally, who is the Sun God? Can we even know who it was? Yes. Yes we can. But before we answer that, it's worth taking a look at a timeline of events leading up to the Sulphur God's birth. Most of the early history of the gods is discussed in small snippets here or there, scattered around in different books or mentioned offhand in a line of dialogue from a minor NPC. Trying to put together a timeline is very tricky, but even having a simple one might help us to understand the questions we have today. So, to start with, the Old Gods and the Lizardmen are both on Earth together. Which came first isn't really clear, nor is how the Lizardmen came about. Next, the Old Gods create the Golden Throne, a means for the Lizardmen and later humans to become new gods, giving them some semblance of self-governance while still under the whims of the Old Gods. Sylvian and Vitruvia work together to create humanity. 
Vitruvia designed humanity, and Sylvian used her powers to give life to those plants. The old gods decide to leave humanity to its own devices. The main reason stated by the traces of Grogoroth is because humanity could never truly understand the old gods' true forms. Before leaving, the old gods decide to make a human king of Mahab and plan the ascension of Ormir. The sun god, the king of Mahab, is used in this ritual. It's unclear if he was willing or not. The two spirits of the sun god and the human Ormir fought for control of the new being created, but the sun god won out. And this new god is now known as Sulphur. He pretended to be Ormir for unclear reasons. Perhaps to hide the fact he was still the sun god from the other gods? After conquering humanity and establishing the worship of the old gods again, Sulphur is killed. How or why is unclear. His body is left to rot outside Mahab, as his soul is scorched in a pit of sulphur. After this, the new gods take over Mahab again. It's worth noting that this timeline is easy to dispute, but think of this as more of a rough guide than a perfectly accurate timeline, but a rough guide is all we need for the remainder of this video. And now, the big reveal. Who is the sun god? I tried a bunch of different layouts for this script, but there was really no way to not have the big reveal early, so I'll just tell you right now. The sun god is... Well, actually, before I tell you who the sun god is, I just have to say first that what I'm about to tell you, it's one of those things that are super obvious in hindsight, and if you're a lore head like me, you'll probably find it funny how obvious it is. Okay, ready? The sun god is Grogoroth. Yeah, really. Okay, maybe it's not quite obvious yet, but let me explain. As you travel through the depths of the Dungeon of Fear and Hunger, if you look closely, you'll see a lot of little hints that link the two gods together. The most obvious sign that Grogoroth was the king of Mahab, and thus the sun god, is the statue at the entrance to the city. We see a large man with what appears to be a snake staff, looking over the souls as they walk into the city. If you have Enki and Das in your party, and talk to them here, it's revealed that the statue is of Grogoroth, as he walked among men in a disguise. Specifically, from the New Testament of Aldmir. To confirm this, you gain affinity for Grogoroth by praying to him in front of the statue. Something else to note about the statue is the snake staff. We see a series of statues outside the tombs of Mahab, with what appears to be kings with similar staffs. Also in the tombs, we can see some more interesting statues. There's a series of puzzles that unlock a hidden door which leads to the corpse of the being that is supposedly Ormir, but as per my last video, is actually Sulphur. Did you notice what the statues were? They're black witches. Statues are the corrupted Grogoroth followers protecting the corpse of Sulphur. You can even find more in the chamber with him. Well, Grogoroth being confirmed as wearing the skin of somebody else, while a statue of him sits at the entrance of Mahab, holding what appears to be a symbol of kingship, and statues of his followers protecting the corpse of the new sun god isn't necessarily saying that Grogoroth himself was the sun god, right? Well, actually, there's a bit more to it than that. In Fear and Hunger, we meet several different Grogoroth followers, some of which aren't exactly loyal to him, but they still use his magic. They are the Black Witch, the Yellow Mages, and the leader of the Yellow Mages, Nashra. The Black Priests, which the playable character Enki is one of, also use his teachings. When you talk to Yellow Mages, you can discover they're on the path to learn about the teachings of Grogoroth, and can even give you a talisman bearing his symbol, the Eclipse Talisman. It's here we find out that Grogoroth's symbol isn't just random circles, it's the Eclipse. The sun temporarily blackened, peeking out behind the moon. Also, we can draw another direct connection between the Yellow Mages and Sulphur, simply through their colour. Yellow, after all, is the colour of Sulphur. The Yellow Mages in the dungeon, but perhaps not elsewhere, are shown by Osar. Also have a strange facial covering. They appear to have a single large eye on their face, and we know now that a single eye is associated with Sulphur. The Black Witch is a unique enemy you can encounter in multiple places, but the one of interest today is in the Library of Mahab. This creature, a witch corrupted by Grogoroth, teleports out of the Headless Star Sigil covered extensively in the previous video. There, 
I suggested that it was a sigil of the sun god before he was killed, due to its similarity to the Vitruvian man when combined with Olmir's sigil. The sigil that is likely the sun gods is also linked to Groveroth. Not only does a black witch use it to teleport, but the headless star symbol looks very similar to the corpse strapped to Groveroth's front. But back to the black witch. The new gods call this creature a slave to Groveroth. It makes sense that his protest would be bound to his will, but... If that's the case, it suggests some odd desires for the god of death. In particular, it makes the actions of the Crimson Fathers from Termina, who are a strange variation of the Black Witches, even more confusing. The Crimson Fathers are very mysterious creatures. We can tell they're Black Witches, or at least beings transformed by Grogoroth, because they look very similar, and are also described as curious, a moniker only ever given to Grogoroth. And the Crimson Fathers are also obsessed with blood. Strangely though, when asked about what they're doing, they give the player a vision of Sulphur. The church where you find the Crimson Fathers has more of interest, but we'll discuss that soon. On the surface, Enki, the Black Priest, doesn't seem like he'd offer much insight into this theory. The Black Priests use a bunch of different magic, right? Well, actually, it's very specific kinds. They prefer to use magic of dead and dying gods. Consider what kinds of magic Enki and the priests in his backstory actually use. Hurting, from Grogoroth, and insect magic, from the God of the Depths. Both gods taken by the Darkness, with a capital D. The Darkness infests the dungeon entirely, and is said to emanate from the God of the Depths. God of the Depths is dying, and does die by the end of the game. And if Grogoroth was sacrificed to make Sulphur, then, well, he's dead too. I'll discuss the death of Grogoroth a bit more soon, but before that, consider this. The Black Priests of Preheval use different magic again. Magic from Grogoroth, and magic from Vanushka. We find out Vanushka is dead from a book hidden in the Priest Donovan's house, and again, Grogoroth is dead from the Ascension. Perhaps the Black in the Black Priest's name come from there using the magic of dead gods, taken by the darkness. As for Nashra, well, his quest to make a new body, is clearly similar to Sulphur and Grogoroth. We find the disembodied wizard in a pit filled with bodies and blood, where he is attempting a ritual to make a new body for himself. Even this massive pile of hundreds of corpses isn't enough to contain his power, and he's just a new god. Imagine how many corpses and how much blood an old god would need to make a new body. We see such a pile of corpses when we visit the traces of Grogoroth in the Gauntlet, a massive mound of hundreds, if not thousands of bodies. We see this again in Termina. Not only is there a literal pile of corpses at the foot of a statue of Grogoroth, but what is the festival but a sacrifice of massive proportions? If you need a lot of bodies, then killing an entire city is a good way to get it. The final group of Grogoroth followers aren't exclusive to him, and actually worship the god of the depths too. The village of cave dwellers sits close to the mouth of this dying god, and when you look closely at their… decorations, their connection to Grogoroth and Olmir becomes clearer. Not only do they have severed heads in multiple places, but they have a person crucified with his head removed. A very selfish style of sacrifice, no doubt. But how is this related to Grogoroth? In both games, you can sacrifice party members to Grogoroth when standing on a ritual circle. In Termina, they just die, but in Fear and Hunger, their heads are removed when sacrificed. The only two gods known for their love of heads are Sulphur and Grogoroth. We can also find a beheaded corpse where the Black Witch is, suggesting that it made its own sacrifice to Grogoroth. Also, this is just a small thing, but the traces of Grogoroth is covered in eye-like growths, and during the fight against him, he only has one normal eye left. His left eye. Sulphur has the right eye. Coincidence? In hindsight, you could probably make a good argument that Grogoroth was a sun god just based on what's in the first game, but Termina definitely fills in some of the gaps. The Crimson Fathers briefly mentioned before are the breadcrumb that maybe look into the Sulphur and Grogoroth connection. Why are these apparent Grogoroth cultists so interested in helping the church and Sulphur? There's an elevator linking the slums and the church, presumably so they can snatch more sacrifices for their bloody rituals. But if you find the hidden area at the eastern end of the sewers, you can find a third place the elevator links to. Deep under the church, in the Foundations of Decay, there's one of the Logic Teleletroscope bunkers, some tombs, a book, and, most interesting for us today, a statue of what appears to be Grogoroth surrounded by corpses. 
Abella also helpfully points out that this place stinks of sulfur too. Something else to note is when you enter the area in the first game where you can meet the traces of Grogoroth, it also says it smells like sulfur. So why is there a statue of Grogoroth underneath a church of sulfur? Well, slotting in the theory that Grogoroth was a sun god answers this neatly. The Crimson Fathers are helping the priests perform sacrifices to sulfur because, well, they're the same god. At the start of Termina, there's an odd scene where the player can be forced to make cubes. Looking at the cubes closely, they have the symbol of the gods etched into them. I have some theories as to what the cubes could mean, but that'll have to wait for a future video. What's important today is that it's possible to make out the sigils of some of the gods on them. Some cubes have the symbol of the god of the depths and the god of fear and hunger on them, likely because depths was sacrificed for the god of fear and hunger. Interestingly though, the brass looking cubes have the symbol of Ulmir and Grogoroth on them, which makes a lot more sense if you accept the theory that Grogoroth was the sun god. There's also some general Grogoroth and sulfur links that aren't particular to either game. Grogoroth, being an old god, also gives the player access to an array of magic. In fact, it's specifically said that blood magic was his gift to mankind, which includes spells like blood portal, blood sword, longinus, uh, ooh, hang on, wait, they're all mere spells. Hmm. Well, all mere, being the new sun god, surely has fire spells, right? Oh, no, wait, Grogoroth has all the fire spells. Huh. Okay. Blood Portal is a spell in both games, but the animation looks a little familiar. Let's compare it to the Grogoroth spell, Hurting. Hmm, that's a little odd. When speaking to the Black Witch, if you threaten to kill it, it says that death is only a stepping stone on its path. Saying that it's part of the path and not the end is strange, because it suggests that the path continues after death for Grogoroth cultists. The God of Death does hold necromancy as his domain, but there is a second god known for manipulating souls and bringing the dead back to life. Sulfur. Souls during the festival and other rituals get sent to his sulfurous pits, scorched in his hatred and rage, and can be sent back to our world to inflict great pain upon others. This ability to bring the dead back to life is unique among all the gods. Vitruvia does something similar through the magnetical skill, but this is closer to triage than properly resurrecting the dead. One of my main arguments in the previous video was that Sulfur walked the earth pretending to be Ulmir, and while doing this, conquered Mahab and became king of that city. Sulfur is called the liar, the deceiver, and many things attributed to Ulmir obviously belong to Sulfur. Once you know he's there. After all, Sulfur's greatest trick was convincing the world he didn't exist. But consider the stories of Grogoroth. He walked the earth wearing human skin, pretending to be human. The conversation with Enki and Das even tells us that the story was in the New Testament of Ulmir. The Book of Ulmir, who we know is Sulfur, telling a story of the blood god pretending to be human. It's secretly a story about Sulfur himself. Also, just something small that wouldn't fit anywhere else. Grogoroth's skin bible in Termina contains the phrase, Grogoroth, the destroyer of men. He who ushers in a new dawn with force and violence. Dawn, yeah, a cheeky little nod to the sun god. It also says that constant sacrifices to him will maintain your relationship, and that's exactly the same with Sulphur and his protective crucifixion rituals. Finally, let's take a look at lucky coins. One side has the sigil of Grogoroth, the eclipse, and the other appears to have the human face of the god. By itself, they're just a cool bit of world building. But the real world inspiration of the coin is of the Roman sun god, Sol Invictus, who is said to be the basis of many myths used in the stories of Jesus Christ. The coin is a direct link between the two ideas, an old empire sun god being reborn as an ascended man god. One or two of these pieces of evidence could just be thematic similarities between the characters of Grogroth and Sulphur. But this is more than just a couple of pieces of evidence, it's a whole pit full of it. But it doesn't really make sense yet, does it? How can the traces of Grogoroth still be around if the sun god himself was sacrificed for the ascension of Sulphur? The old understanding of the process of ascension is wrong. 
The current belief is that two beings, an old god and a half new god human, have their souls merged together. During this merger, their personalities and abilities are shuffled together, and two new beings are formed, one stronger, one weaker, but both ascended gods. This was supported by two things. We see the girl ascend to become the god of fear and hunger in the first game, but in Termina, we still see the influence of the god of the depths, the god who we killed to fuel her ascension. Secondly, a conversation with the mysterious man in black, who explicitly tells us two gods are formed in the process, but one is lowered and weaker somehow. But as it turns out, we weren't considering the whole picture. It's said that when the old gods leave our reality, their traces are left behind. We meet the traces of Grogroth in the first game who tells us this. But does that only happen when they leave? Why not when they die too? Vanushka died, and we still see its influence everywhere. God of the Depths died, and we still see its influence too. So, I propose a new explanation of Ascension. The start is the same. We take a half new god human and an old god and combine their souls. However, instead of two gods being born, it's just the one. There is no lesser god created during the process, but merely the traces of the previous god left behind. When Grogoroth was killed to make Sulphur, the traces of Grogoroth remained. When Depths was killed to make the god of fear and hunger, the traces of the Depths remained. This theory leaves us with an awkward idea. Originally, it was believed that when Ulmir ascended, both he and Sulphur were born, but Sulphur was the weak one. My previous video suggested that it was Ulmir who was the weak one, and Sulphur pretended to be him to conquer Europa and Mahab. And all Ulmir worship in the West was actually Sulphur worship. Now, with this new theory, well, there never was an Ulmir. The human was completely consumed during the ascension, and only the cruel Sulphurous god and the traces of Grogoroth remained. It's worth talking about what a trace of a god is. That's a trace with a capital T. We actually have very little to go off. The traces of Grogoroth say that the old gods left. This was taken to mean that the traces are the remains of the influence the gods had when they were physically here in our reality. The gods were physically here and present in our reality, but when they left, just their traces remained, slowly fading over time, even out of memory. Vanushka is a good example. Being the god of nature, its presence brought flora and fauna, as well as natural events such as volcanoes and storms. Now that it's dead, those things will slowly disappear from the world. Since the old gods rewrite reality with their presence, we may not actually be able to comprehend any old god that is left in the past after their traces fade, because reality is actually different now. But it's never actually specified that an old god needs to be alive for the traces to exist. We only ever see one explicitly confirmed traces in game, Grogoroth. Rur might be mere traces in Termina, but the only person who says that is Percale, and it's worth remembering that he is a literal cult leader openly trying to recruit us. The traces of Grogoroth don't give us much more information than what's already been said. In the previous video, one of the arguments I used for Sulphur taking over Europa was that Osar realised that the church in Brihevel feels different than what Olmir usually feels like, and you may be wondering how that fits with this new theory. Preheval is the heart of Sulphur worship, and Sulphur is waking up. The regular Olmir feeling was simply just Sulphur in his weakened state. Doesn't the man in black say that two gods were born from the ascension? Well, he speaks in a vague and poetic manner. As one, the ascended one became two. This could just as easily refer to the traces of Grogroth being born, since it technically is a different entity than both Grogroth and Sulphur. All in all, it seems our previous understanding of ascension was flawed, and that while technically two gods are born from the process, one is merely traces of the previous old god consumed in the ritual. But the question remains. Why would Grogoroth allow himself to be sacrificed for the Ascension? And why was Sulphur killed again after that? The Sun God Grogoroth died so that all near the Ascended One could be born. The question is, why? He's a god of death and violence, 
Why would he willingly sacrifice himself to give the petulant children that are humanity their own god? There's two options here. The first is that he was unwilling, and the other old gods forced him. The other is that he wanted to be sacrificed, or at least agreed to it. I think that he at least accepted his fate. In the studies of Grogroth in the first game, it's said that he's curious, and wears human skin so as to not scare us, so he at least cares about us a little. Ultimately, it doesn't matter. When it comes to the multiple deaths and resurrections of Grogroth, the desires of Sylvian matter much more. The Goddess of Love and the God of Death have many ties. They're inexorably linked. There is no destruction without creation, and destruction makes room for more creation. They even mated at one point, with Sylvian eventually birthing the God of Nature, Venushka. But there's more subtle connections that we can find between the gods. The most direct is the spell Rebirth of the Beloved. It's a unique spell required for Darcy's S ending in the first game, a mixture between Sylvian and Grogoroth magic. It's a more potent form of necromancy, with the caveat that it's only for the one that you love the most. A spell only working on the one you love puts it into the domain of Sylvian, but all necromancy is the domain of Grogoroth. The item that gives you the spell even has Grogoroth's symbol on it, even though the spell itself is classified as a Sylvian spell. The ritual requires the shedding of blood to bring your love back, but they're different. They're more bloodthirsty and violent, and eager to inflict suffering on others. This all suggests that Sylvian and Grogoroth planned ahead of time to attempt to resurrect the God of Destruction after his sacrifice to Ormi. Sylvian is a lover attempting to resurrect her dead love, and Grogoroth is a being transformed by hatred and rage, eager to inflict such suffering on others through his sulfur cult. The sulfur god as we see him in Termina is a rebirth version of Grogoroth. His skin even looks the same as Lagarde in Darcy's S ending. The rebirth Lagarde even proclaims, Shed my human skin, I don't need it. The shedding of skin shows up a few times as a metaphor for becoming something greater throughout the series. So it's an interesting inversion when Grogoroth dons human skin to lower himself and walk among us, only to shed that skin again through rebirth. There's more interesting notes about Sylvian too. Sylvian was the one who ordered Vitruvia to create humanity in the first place, in the likeness of herself. And Vitruvia was the one who designed the ascended god Olmir, including that he needed an old god sacrifice. Did Sylvian order Vitruvia specifically to include Grogoroth? Sylvian, being the goddess of love, has a strong theme of joining or merging two beings together, which is basically what ascending is. Her ordering Vitruvia to do this is definitely within her ballpark, and it would explain why it seems like Vitruvia is now working with the Cult of Sulphur. The ritual is unfinished, and Vitruvia still has a job to do. That was an issue from the last video. Vitruvia planned the ascension of Ormir to create the perfect man, but the Sun God won the Battle of Wills. Despite this, it seemed like Vitruvia was helping the Cult of Sulphur in their plans. If the true plan was to create Sulphur all along, then it makes sense for Vitruvia to help his cult. As mentioned earlier, we see several massive sacrifices to Grogoroth, where there's piles upon piles of corpses killed in his name. When you consider the spell Rebirth of the Beloved, which involves a blood sacrifice for the resurrection, and long-term sacrifices like the festival or the church basement, and it's reasonable to suggest that these sacrifices are part of a larger project to resurrect the dead god. A whole sewer in the dungeon filled with corpses wasn't enough to get Nashra a new body, so how many would a full old god need? Perhaps even the massive worldwide war before the festival helped this ritual too. One thing I'm not sure about is if Grogoroth won the Battle of Wills against the human Olmir, why does he need to go through Rebirth? Is it to purge the emotions added by joining a human to him, and to make him pure destruction again? At the moment, I'm not entirely sure, but I think I can make a good guess. Something worth pointing out is that Sylvian had attempted something strange with a mass of people before. A story so important it's mentioned in the Sylvian books in both games is that she made a sea of people perform in an orgy. We know that performing sex acts in a Sylvian ritual can make a marriage, but Performing them with many people creates a monstrosity. Was she attempting to make a marriage greater than anything ever seen before or after? What would the marriage of thousands of people look like? This event happened after Sylvian realised that humanity could never love her the same way she loved them. 
I suggest that this massive orgy was Sylvian's first attempt at making a human that could love her back. The ascension of Ormir and the rebirth of Sulphur is Sylvian's second attempt. Maybe now, he could finally be just hers completely. This is more they do in editing here. I'm just interjecting because I have a solid theory about why Sulphur has to go through rebirth. When you talk to Samari in Rare's realm under the church, she says some interesting things. She claims the world is a surprise for her, meaning Marina. You might think she's just referring to what she did to Marina's father, but she specifically mentions the physical world here too. It's a bit weird since she didn't have anything to do with making the world. I originally thought it was logic taking over her mind, since it looks like the machine god was the one building the wooden realm, as seen with her hands building the pillars. Logic also calls upon her sister, Olivia, trying to pull the two together. Ryla, the girl used to make logic, also shares the same soul type as Samari, being the radiant soul. But it doesn't really add up when you look at it closely. Consider the abilities associated with the Radiant Soul, being blood sacrifice and masturbation. They're abilities designed to call upon the old gods. Radiance itself is also associated with the sun, aka Sulphur, the new sun god. Samari's moonscorch form takes a lot of notes from Sulphur. She has a halo, she stands in the crucifixion pose, cast necromancy, and even only has one eye. The name dysmorphia is an old term for a psychological condition where a person thinks their body is severely wrong in some way, which definitely fits the multiple physical transformations the sun god has gone through. The physical form of logic appears to be sitting above a globe, and is a gateway to the new green hue, and she controls both creation and destruction, Sylvian and Grogoroth. Again, like Sulphur, who was a combination of the two, being the soul of Grogoroth in a body based on that of Sylvian. So, instead of logic influencing Samari, it seems that Sulphur is influencing the both of them. I'll leave the full implications of Sulphur manipulating logic for a future video, but for now let's consider what the behaviour of logic and Samari can tell us about the Sun God. Well, he obviously wasn't happy about being stuck in his body, which is pretty obvious. Importantly, he built something for her. Two questions here. What did he build, and who was it for? The her is almost certainly Sylvian. There's only two explicitly female divinities, Sylvian and Vitruvia, and Grogoroth has a romantic history with Sylvian. The next question is, what did he build? There's two possibilities here. When Sulphur ascended, he explicitly re-established worship of the old gods. It could be that he built this new kingdom. But I think the second option is most likely. That being that Sulphur built what we called Rare's Realm, and through it, humanity as a whole. Not the wooden parts of Rare's Realm, which we see actually being built by logic, but the purple clay parts. Why is this the best option? Well, Logic and Samari are influenced by Sulphur, and both insist on trying to impose their will on Rare's Realm. The human Ormir also sculpted things in clay, as told by the man in black. Rare has the ability to show us the truth of reality. The exact nature of this realm isn't clear, but it appears to be linked to dreams and the subconscious. What happens if you mould the dreams of humanity to your will? We might have an answer to that. If you pay careful attention during Termina, you may notice several things are said to have been happening recently. The world war being the most obvious, but there's more than that. In the church there's a stained glass window that appears to say Anno Domini 1866, suggesting that it was added about 80 years before the start of the game. We don't know how long the logic project has been in development for, but considering there's a bunker for it underneath the church, it suggests that it was built there when the windows were installed. Perhaps the church was renovated as part of a deal to build the bunker there. Furthermore, the engraving skill Marina has, which engraves the sigil of a god on a person, is said to have only been recently used on the face. It doesn't have to be, it can be used anywhere on the body, but it's a modern trend to use it on the face. Likewise, Dan's organ harvest skill 
also says that harvesting organs used to be taboo, but is now widely used. So there's a massive project to elevate humanity through logic, as well as widespread organ harvesting and engraving faces with magic. That definitely sounds like sulfur influence. The hexen itself is the best example of sulfur's desire to mould humanity. When using it in the first game, it says that skills are engraved into your head. And in the second game, it's primarily accessed by dreaming and speaking to Percolet, a sulfur cult member. Sulfur being the connection between man and the gods gives humanity a direct way to draw on their power, in effect elevating humanity to their level. Sulfur's project is one of trying to close the distance between humanity and the gods. With all of this, it seems like what Grogoroth built for Sylvian was humanity itself. Sylvian wanted humanity to love her back, and Grogoroth has been trying to rebuild them to do so ever since. Sylvia's first attempt was a massive orgy. Then Grogoroth tried by building a link between humanity and the old gods by being reborn as a half-human. Then finally, he sacrificed himself again to try to manipulate humanity's minds by force. The question is, did it work? The Logic Project will supposedly allow humanity to elevate itself as one to the level of godhood. So, if it works, then yes. Grogoroth's plants will have finally borne fruit. Humanity will finally be equal to the old gods. That is, if logic truly does work as planned. When you look back at it, it's kind of obvious, right? Grogoroth being the sun god fits very neatly with what we see in game, and honestly, I think we could have made a good argument just based on what's in the first game, although some of the motivations would be missing. Looking at some of the evidence in Termina, sometimes it feels like the developer, Miro, was grabbing us by the shoulders and shaking us, begging us to notice. Unlike the first video, this one doesn't end with big questions hanging over it. While I'm happy with what I presented today, I admit I could still be wrong. The lore in Fear and Hunger is very vague intentionally, and I suspect there's more than one way you could put these puzzle pieces together. The theory I've put forth today is as accurate as I could make it, and I base it upon facts compiled from the games instead of trying to make the facts fit a theory. If you have any counter evidence for this video, or the previous one, then I would absolutely love to hear it. If I'm wrong here, then that just means I've got more digging to do, and believe me when I say I would be very happy to dig some more. I'd love to hear what you thought about this theory in general. Do you think it's right? Is there a piece of evidence you think I missed that would add to it or disprove it? Before we finish up, I'd just like to thank a few people. First of all, you, my favourite viewer, for watching all the way until the very end. Secondly, all channel members and anybody else who supports the channel through likes or comments or anything. It really helps a lot. Thirdly, all the viewers who come to my live streams. We discussed Fear and Hunger lore a lot there, maybe too much, and it actually really helps to bounce ideas off of you guys, and you're just fun to hang out with. I'd also like to thank my friend Allbones Jones, who patiently answered my endless lore questions, and even let me use some of his Fear and Hunger 1 footage for this video. He's got some great Fear and Hunger content on his channel too, some of it edited by yours truly, so make sure to go check him out in the link in the description. Another Fear and Hunger YouTuber who I'd like to thank was No Commentary, whose exhaustive videos on everything in Fear and Hunger 1 and 2 helped my research quite a bit. Their link will also be in the description. And finally, I'd like to thank the Fear and Hunger Discord, particularly the Theory and Lore channel. Their lively discussions there helped me a lot with the first video, and really pushed me in the right direction. Thank you for watching, and remember, the most important ingredient in a pinecone pig is the pinecone.